tell me? The lodge in Coronation Street. No, no. <laughs> the TV advert for false teeth. I've got it. Simon D. To television historians, Simon D was a modern Icarus. British television's first casualty, a man who made a Faustian bargain with fame and has exchanged seven years in the spotlight for 33 years in obscurity. The boy who got too big for his boots. D was so far ahead of his time. I think he's the grandfather um, to the likes of sort of Jonathan Ross. Simon D, the great hit of British television, 17 million viewers. D time was enormous. You've got to remember that he was as big, if not bigger, than uh, Chris Evans. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing. We'd never seen anything like that on television before. You can't help watching these old shows without liking this guy and also wondering, you know, what has television done with him? Why did it throw this talent away? This enmity erupted between then the controller Bill Cotton of BBC and D. Bill Cotton was a very tough uh, businessman, the toughest BBC person I ever met. Cotton eased him out and it was the television equivalent of a sacking. Simon, from being the top uh, of his profession and suddenly going to absolutely nothing, uh, must have been a dreadful thing to have had to cope with. About a year later, he's on the dole. And ultimately, his fines caught up with him. He was sent up, I believe, to uh, Richmond uh, Magistrate Court to be tried for a fine. And who should be sitting on the bench? Bill Cotton. Bill Cotton. Bill Cotton. Bill Cotton. Bill Cotton. Sacked and found guilty by the same man. That's not just bad luck. That's taking the piss. You are watching our deconstruction. This is part one. For years, the fear-ridden world of television has been fascinated and horrified by the cautionary tale of Simon D. But until now, the man has remained enigmatically tight-lipped about the full circumstances of his rise and fall. Understandably so, because over the past 30 years, when the television industry has acknowledged his existence at all, it's only been in order to ridicule him as a loser in the way that the media love to do. Your fall was accelerated, wasn't it? Just was straight down into the crevasse. Yes, yes. You went from earning a great deal of money to absolutely nothing. Yes, well, everything just disappeared. I, I have this theory a little bit that we're all under the, the, the sort of the, uh, the, the watch of people that are higher and wiser than us, and they decide what we get and what we're given. Um, and they decided to take it away, who they were. And perhaps it did me a lot of good, otherwise I'd end up bald and, and fat and generally sort of gone, you know? And tell me, you were offered... <laughs> you were offered... That um, wasn't a personal remark. <laughs> Earlier this year, the makers of this programme all right, me, persuaded him to take part in a discussion programme about the nature of celebrity. And as a result, he gradually opened up a little and finally gave us a glimpse into what it's like to be Simon D. But we love it. I mean, we love dumping people. And That's now, if you watch television, <laughs> it's all about people being dumped rudely and turned out of desert well, islands and turned out of houses, and they're not even celebrities. See, the, see little, the little tiny thesis that I'm trying to push here is that the 60s provides a licence for the emergence of a, of a sort of celebrity. I know you can all say, well, film stars were celebrities, Errol Flynn was a celebrity, but, but this particular television celebrity is born in the 60s. And Absolutely. it's born in the 60s because suddenly individualism, you can be mm -hmm. who you are, and to come on and be mm -hmm. a little bit strange mm -hmm. and to be a little bit mm -hmm. different is suddenly mm -hmm. prized. Yeah. But the, the celebrities become celebrities partially because the people in charge of television networks cause, them, cause this to be. Absolutely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And really, we're suffering from a surfeit of vapid souls who really haven't got nothing to offer, and they get fortunes of doing it and become instant celebrities and can't handle it. And when they're dropped from the show, they burst into tears or throw themselves under a truck or something. Um, and, and they're not attractive at all, poor souls. But, but don't you think there's something very deep going, deeper in a sense that it seems to me that it's an issue of control versus out of control. And in looking at the tapes that I saw of you, Simon, what I liked and probably, and I can say this as an outsider, what probably scared the horses, which I think was cool, was that you got up, you did television, and you said, basically, I know exactly what I'm doing. Just point the camera at me and get the fuck out of my face. You know, get out of my way he, and let me just do it. I, I have well, they let me do that. Exactly. Until? Until the, the axe fell down. Why did the axe fall down? I never knew why the axe fell down. This program is developing to an analysis of me. When you were doing, like when the Simon D show was on, what people remember from that 
is that at the end you go off in an E-type mm. with a blonde. I know, isn't it lovely? And you look as though you're going to fuck her, you know, and she jumps in, she's dead eager, and her hair's blowing around all over the place, and you look absolutely delighted. And people remember that because you were daring to say, I'm going to have a wonderful time in a great big car with a blonde who's just jumped, and that really is something, that was something. You embodied physically the 60s. And, and do you know what I mean? It's like you looked like, if someone were to think about it, as the break between the 50s, you know, totally wiped out, and what the 60s was. You, uh, being a kid then and thinking, looking at you, and I, if I'd seen you then, I would have thought, you look like what my idea of that whole, of the whole era was about. And the Royal Lancaster Hotel took on a way out look in the cause of charity when Simon D and some of London's swinging scene makers stepped out in fashions that might well be all the rage ten years hence. Despite appearances, Dee came from a surprisingly traditional background. My upbringing was one of discipline. You know, I went to, to a public school, um, and I went to the had active service in the Air Force, five years of that, and then you came out in, in, in sort of late 50s and early 60s, the world was more or less controlled and disciplined and well-mannered and respectful and clean, and that was in me as it was in others. But I did have a dream which was that I would score in this field that I'd found, because I left the Air Force not really knowing too much and just worked my way through from job to job and got to Caroline when we put this radio station on the ship and suddenly we were the cat's whiskers. More people listened to us than the BBC and that freaked them absolutely, because here was this new generation bringing in Dylan and Streisand and Tamla Motown. This is Radio Caroline on 199, England's first commercial radio station. My name's Simon D. with you for the next two hours. First one off the top of the pile, the Hollies, Rock and Robin. Simon was, I, I think I'm right in saying, the first voice on Pirate Radio. And I met him on board, and I found him a terribly nice guy, you know, and um, very tall, good-looking guy, um, fair hair, as I remember, and um, very, very pleasant indeed. Anyway, welcome to a very special show on Caroline, because for the very first time in commercial radio, and for the very first time nearly in England, uh, this is Simon D. on behalf of all of us on Caroline Welsh. The accent was really rather well done, I always thought. I mean, it was, I suppose, mid-Atlantic. He must have done it a little tiny bit when he was hardly mid-Atlantic. He was just about two miles out into the North Sea. But D. was more than just a mid-Atlantic draw. He soon became the authentic voice of popular culture. Caroline's top disc jockey, Simon D., made the presentation and told the group all about the thousands of requests for their records that he receives. And when you're the voice of popular culture, you soon find yourself on friendly terms with guys from advertising firms. Uh, you became an, an advertising commodity. Oh, a dream. Not, I was yeah. a dream for them. Well, surely, I don't know. But well, wasn't it, that I, how you got on in... in well, weren't you picked up from an advertisement? Wasn't there? I believe so. I did the Smith's Crisps, which is quite hard to say. Yeah. Crunch time. Even if you haven't got a list. Do you crunch? You don't? Well, you should, you know. Get your crunch disc. Fast. It was this very ad that brought Simon to the attention of Mrs. Cotton, whose son, Bill, just happened to be Mr. Big at the BBC. Just send three empty bags and one and sixpence to Smith's Crisps for your crunch disc. And as they say in television documentaries when they're just approaching a commercial break, for Simon D, it soon would come to the crunch.